Over the past few years, Kentucky has wowed the nation with aggressive efforts to modernize our health care delivery system, our P through 12 education system, and our economy, particularly our global presence. In the process, we have become a more vibrant, competitive, and a stronger state. But a fundamental weakness continues to hold us back. An archaic tax code that was designed for a 20th century economy. Kentucky deserves better, and it needs better. To compete for 21st century jobs and create 21st century businesses. To help us develop and maintain a highly trained and healthy workforce. And to raise the quality of life of our families. We must create a modern tax structure that works for us, not against us. Today, as I promised, I'm unveiling a proposal to modernize Kentucky's tax structure. The Kentucky Competes Plan contains 22 specific changes based in large part on the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Tax Reform that I created two years ago. The commission, headed by Lieutenant Governor Jerry Abramson, who joins me today, pursued five fundamental goals for our tax system. Competitiveness. Kentucky must be equipped to continue attracting and retaining jobs and investment. Fairness. Tax obligations must be fair to different groups of taxpayers. Simplicity. The code must be easy to understand and follow. Elasticity. State revenues must mirror changes in our economy. And adequacy. Our tax system must do its job and provide sufficient revenue. With those same five principles as a backdrop, my plan improves Kentucky's ability to compete in the following ways. It lowers tax rates for individuals and businesses. It expands our tax base. It protects Kentucky's signature industries. It removes burdens that punished Kentucky-based businesses as compared to out-of-state competitors. It takes into account new technology and the changing marketplace. It adjusts to demographic trends. It brings Kentucky's taxes in line with surrounding states. It improves the health of our workforce. And it creates jobs by making Kentucky more attractive to businesses. Now you all have received handouts that explain the proposals in the Kentucky Competes Plan and their fiscal impacts, but I want to mention a few highlights. The plan lowers the individual income tax rate structure. Every Kentuckian, and let me stress, every Kentuckian will benefit from this change when it's coupled with the current family size tax credit a newly established state earned income tax credit, and a new whole harmless credit. My plan also lowers the top corporate tax rate from 6% to 5.9%, bringing Kentucky lower than all but one neighboring state. Also for businesses, my plan phases in what's called single factor apportionment. This, folks, is a big job producer. Businesses in Kentucky that operate in multiple states currently determine their corporate income based on a three-factor formula of sales, property, and payroll, with sales double-weighted. My plan proposes that we join almost 20 other states in switching to a formula that is based solely on sales. As a result, multi-state companies with a significant physical presence in Kentucky that includes lots of payroll and lots of property, will see a significant tax saving. This will encourage businesses like large manufacturers and companies headquartered in Kentucky to expand in Kentucky and for other businesses to locate here. Furthermore, my plan creates various tax credits to encourage investment in small businesses and high-tech research and it exempts certain inventory from the state property tax. <clears throat> My plan also makes several changes that help our signature industries, those relating to bourbon, 
equine, and food animals. It creates a healthier workforce by raising the tax on cigarettes and other tobacco, including taxing e-cigarettes for the first time. It also broadens the sales tax to include selected services. Kentucky's sales tax structure is far behind in acknowledging a fundamental and ongoing transition from a goods-based economy to a service-based economy. In 1960, and look at this chart. This chart tells the whole story when it comes to our economy. In 1960, consumer spending on goods represented 53.4% of personal expenditures. By 2012, that number had fallen to only 33.8%. Conversely, in 1960, consumer spending on services represented 46.6% of personal expenditures. By 2012, that number had increased to 66.2%. Look at this trend. This trend from goods to services has seriously eroded Kentucky's tax base when it comes to the sales tax. Therefore, we must modernize our sales tax structure. Kentucky already taxes some services, but not nearly what most other states do. My plan also brings Kentucky closer to most neighboring states in how we tax retirement income for those with, with high earnings while still giving those taxpayers more favorable treatment than those other states. This nation's and this state's demographics are changing. But while our population is aging, retired people still enjoy all of the same protections, all of the same services that government provides. This change does not affect adjusted gross incomes of less than $80,000 a year. So elderly people with fixed incomes are not affected by this proposal. In fact, this proposal will affect only about 90,000 of the 1.8 million tax filers in Kentucky. Also, we will continue to exempt Social Security benefits from taxation. My plan eliminates taxes on certain classes of tangible personal property that cost more to collect than it, they bring in. And finally, my plan would simplify tax forms by requiring married couples to use the same filing status on their state tax form as they use on their federal form. And while I'm at it, let me reiterate that I support putting a constitutional amendment on the ballot that would allow our local communities to vote on a local sales tax for specific projects that they may need. That issue will be addressed in separate legislation, but it is no less critical to our community's success. Now, most of these proposals that you see are not new. Far from it. Like I said, they're based on, in large part, on recommendations made by the Commission on Tax Reform. Many of these recommendations were also featured in 12 previous studies of Kentucky's tax structure completed since 1982. So we've been talking about many of these specific fixes to our outdated tax structure for over three decades. The Commission's report has been in the public domain since December of 2012, and every leader in Kentucky ought to be intimately familiar with it by now. The Commission held town hall meetings in every congressional district of this state. And Lieutenant Governor Abramson himself has delivered over 50 speeches discussing its recommendations. I've addressed these issues on many occasions as well. In fact, most of these ideas were discussed in detail with legislative leaders during the negotiations over the unfunded public pension liability in the 2013 session. So nobody who's been paying attention should be surprised by these proposals. And yes, although raising additional revenue was not the primary motivation of this process, my plan will achieve that secondary goal once it is fully implemented. The silver lining in making a tax structure more modern and more competitive is that it results in more revenue as our economy grows. That's common sense and a defining characteristic of a sound tax code. The initial 
additional revenue created is modest, approximately $210 million, which is just over 2% of current official revenue estimates. It also roughly matches the amount of our current structural imbalance, meaning that with these changes, state government will again be living within its means. That's a good thing. And in the long term, because we will finally have a 21st century tax code tied to a 21st century economy, additional revenue will be generated as the economy grows. Finally, a word about process. Representative Rick Rand, who is here with us today, who is chairman of the House Appropriations and Revenue Committee, has agreed to introduce this legislation in order to begin the discussion. And I understand that the committee will hold hearings to receive input from the public. However, I am well aware that a proposal to amend our tax code is a politically sensitive matter, especially during an election year. I'm also aware that what needs to be a very serious discussion regarding tax reform could easily be turned into a political football to be used by political parties in the upcoming elections. I am determined to avoid that possibility. Therefore, I will not ask either chamber to vote on any bill containing these provisions or any version thereof, unless a consensus has been reached by a majority of both chambers which will assure the bill's passage. This process is not new. This process proved successful in our efforts in the 2013 session to resolve our unfunded public pension liability. And in my opinion, it is the only approach which offers any opportunity for success with tax reform. The bottom line, it's time to make these needed improvements to our tax structure. The quality of our future depends on it, as does the future of our children and our children's children. Thank you.